Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone, this is Air, and welcome to the 50th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Helmut Hubner, who was 17 years old when he was executed for speaking out against Nazi Germany. When we first read it, uh, I mean, we opened it and we saw, you know, at the end, you could see the ink was a little blotted out because he must have shed some tears uh, because he knew that was the end of his life on this earth. Dear Sister Summerfield and family, when you receive this letter, I will be dead. But before my execution, I have been granted one wish to write three letters to my loved ones. I want to thank you for the letter you sent to me, dear Sister Summerfield, which they withheld from me. I also want to thank you for the many happy hours I was able to spend in the circle of your family. Please remember me kindly. I'm very thankful to my Heavenly Father that this agonizing life is coming to an end this evening. I could not stand it any longer anyway. My Father in Heaven knows that I have done nothing wrong. I know that God lives and he will be the proper judge of this matter until our happy union in that better world, I remain your friend and brother in the gospel, Helmut. Between 1918 and 1933, and before Nazi Germany, there was the German Republic. Helmut Hubner was born there on January 8, 1925. Helmut grew up in a religious Mormon family following the Church of Latter-day Saints, also known as the LDS Church. His mother raised him alone before meeting a man by the name of Hugo Hubner, who in turn gave Helmut his last name. Growing up, Helmut was an extremely intelligent boy who was a Boy Scout for many years. He respected his parents and was well received by his peers. Now Nazi Germany, Hitler's reign was just starting, and many people felt that he was a powerful speaker who promoted a better Germany with strong national pride. He promised work to the unemployed and promoted many other things that got many people on board without knowing they were making a deal with the devil. Some opposed him, but they were soon outnumbered or stayed silent. In 1933, the Boy Scouts were banned in Germany by the Nazis, and many youth joined Hitler Youth with their motto being blood and honor. At the age of eight, Helmut went from a Mormon-supported Boy Scout member to Hitler Youth, and many said that initially, Helmut was very excited about joining the group. He was very popular with other members and overall had no issues. While in school, he even wrote a long essay about why Hitler was a good leader and was very happy with his work and the good grade he received. Being the bright and intuitive boy he was, he began to learn more about his religion and theology. Although he grew up in a family that was not so much into politics and his adoptive father Hugo was pro-Hitler, Helmut took it upon himself to learn about politics. His friends were later quoted saying that he knew more than many of his elders, and he would purposely ask questions he knew they would not be able to answer just for the fun of it. In November of 1938, at the age of 13, Helmut witnessed the Night of the Broken Glass. A 17-year-old Jewish boy by the name of Herschel killed a German diplomat, and with that, a violent riot ensued that aimed towards destroying everything Jewish. Jewish-owned homes, synagogues, schools, stores, and hospitals were demolished and or destroyed by Nazis and Hitler Youth. The name came from the amount of broken glass that was scattered in the streets. Although the riots were not started by Jewish men, 30,000 of them were arrested and put into concentration camps. This night started the decision of the final solution, which meant that their plan was to kill all Jewish people. 
That was the first time Helmut questioned Hitler and his regime. He did not like how Jews were being treated, and he felt that as a Christian, he had an obligation to open people's eyes to what was really happening. Not too soon before the Night of the Broken Glass, a Jewish member on the board of his church by the name of Solomon Schwartz was met by a sign on the church's door. The sign read, Jews not allowed inside. One of the religious leaders by the name of Arthur Xander banned Jews from attending any services. Arthur was a Mormon branch president who was a Nazi and wanted to prove that the Latter-day Saints were behind the movement and good Germans. He also wanted to start each church service off by saluting and giving praise to Hitler. Although Helmut disagreed with this new rule and was very upset, he still went to church because he knew that there were other people who had the same mentality as him, including his two friends, Rudolf Hub and Karl Heinz. The following year, in September of 1939, Germany invaded Poland and Hitler came out with a rule that German citizens were no longer allowed to listen to radio unless it was approved by the German leaders. Propaganda filled the streets, and if people were caught listening to any foreign broadcasted radio station, they were in most situations sentenced to death. There were still illegal radio sets in people's houses, but it was also common for soldiers to bring back radios from other countries after they had fought in war. Helmut's older half-brother by the name of Gerhard Hubner was a Nazi soldier, and after his group of troops defeated the French army, he brought back a small roller radio and stashed it in his closet. In 1941, now 16 years old, Helmut began working at the Hamburg Social Authority where he met a boy by the name of Gerhard Dewar, not to be confused with his older brother. The two shared the same ideas, and Helmut later recruited him to join his friends Rudolf and Karl in a resistance group against the Nazi party. They began to sneak off and listen to foreign radio stations. That same year, Helmut found his brother's shortwave radio that he hid away in the closet, so now he was able to listen to stations like the BBC when he was home alone. His brother had actually been sent off to fight again, so he was not worried about being caught. After listening to what was truly going on and how the German people were being misled, Helmut came up with the idea of creating visual pieces that would make German people aware of what was really happening in the war and to tell them that the Nazi party was a bunch of criminals. He also wanted to warn people that Germany was inevitably going to lose the war and that as a former member of Hitler Youth, he had witnessed how they mistreated people. He believed the British accounts of what was happening over his own country because they gave a more detailed account of what was going on. Helmut gathered his friends, Rudolf and Karl, after a Sunday church service and told them to come over to his house so they could hear the broadcast as well. Being that Helmut was working as Arthur Xander's secretary, he had been given a typewriter. The boys then spent time typewriting warning messages on pamphlets and were able to pass out around 60 of them that read, German boys, do you know the country without freedom? The country of terror and tyranny? Yes, you know it well, but are afraid to talk about it. They have intimidated you to such an extent that you don't dare talk for fear of reprisals. Yes, you are right. It is Germany, Hitler Germany. Through their unscrupulous terror tactics against young and old, men and women, they have succeeded in making you spineless puppets to do their bidding. Some flyers said that Hitler was a murderer, and some said that he was the guilty one. These pamphlets were handed out throughout Hamburg, and some were left in hiding spots like telephone booths, mailboxes, or pinned on bulletin boards. They were cautious and scared, but had a little bit of confidence because Helmut had a Nazi stamp given to him by Arthur, so he had stamped each pamphlet as if it were official notices from the Nazi party. The boys also made a pact that if one of them were to ever get caught, that person would take the full blame and not incriminate the other two. After the first wave of passing out flyers was successful, Helmut then worked diligently to create more flyers with new information and Rudolf later said that Helmut had created 29 different flyers. 
Now, as opposed to only making statements about the Nazi party being liars, he now backed up all of his claims with evidence and made it known where the information was coming from. Out of the hundreds of pamphlets that were passed out, less than 10 were turned into the Gestapo or Nazi police. The Gestapo knew that there was an anti-Nazi group around but had no leads at the time and assumed it was an older college professor or a knowledgeable man. One night after passing out flyers, Karl was stopped by the Gestapo and they asked him what he was doing. Karl responded that he was coming from a friend's house and when they asked where that friend lived, he gave another friend's address who lived across from Helmut. It was this scare that made Karl burn any extra pamphlets he was not able to pass out before going home so that he would never be caught with one in his possession. Other than that one scare, things were going well and Helmut was becoming more and more eager to get the word out, so he came up with a new idea to pass out flyers in French. Karl tried to talk him out of it because he felt that it was too risky and knew that Helmut was not fluent in French. Helmut then brought up a young church member by the name of Werner Kantz, who was fluent in French and said that he was going to ask him. The next church service, Helmut went up to Werner and asked if he would be willing to translate something in French for him. Werner was open to helping, so Helmut gave him a pamphlet. Werner took his time reading it, and the more he read, the angrier he got until he had enough and shoved the paper in Helmut's chest. He told Helmut that he wanted no parts in speaking against Nazis at all. Watching this encounter from the office window above was a member of the Nazi party by the name of Heinrich who was assigned to watch out for anything out of the ordinary at that church. He came out and asked to speak to Werner and questioned him about the encounter. Werner brushed it off as if it was not a big deal, but Heinrich insisted on knowing what happened. Werner opened up and let him know everything. And that's when Heinrich came up with a plan to have Werner pretend that he was interested in order for him to have physical proof. Werner agreed and went back downstairs to Helmut saying that he changed his mind. In that moment, Helmut was hesitant and did not give Werner a copy. He waited almost a week and on February 5th, 1942, Helmut came to church and gave Werner a copy of one of his pamphlets. Without saying anything or even looking at the paper, Werner walked it upstairs and gave it to Heinrich. Heinrich read the pamphlet, and once he was finished, he got on the phone and called the Gestapo who came to the church within 10 minutes. Helmut was immediately arrested and directed the Gestapo to his grandparents' house where they in turn found the typewriter and flyers. After collecting the evidence, he was taken to the Hamburg Gestapo headquarters where he was interrogated. The following week, Karl noticed that Helmut was not there at church, and after service, one of the church leaders made an announcement that Helmut was arrested, but he had no other details. Karl's mother then questioned him because he had been going to Helmut's house multiple times a week, but Karl reassured his mother that he had no idea why Helmut was arrested, and inside was praying that Helmut kept his promise on the pact that they had made earlier. While being detained by the Gestapo, they came out with a news report about Helmut stating that they persuaded him to confess, which meant that he was tortured into confessing that he was responsible for passing out the pamphlets. Not satisfied with the confession, they continued to torture Helmut until he admitted that two other friends helped him pass out the flyers. On February 10th, just five days after Helmut was arrested, Rudolf and Karl were also arrested. All three were beaten even after admitting to listening to BBC radio and passing out pamphlets because the Gestapo could not believe no adults had helped them with the resistance. One man by the name of Otto was a family friend who had visited for a short while, so they brought him in for interrogation for three days. When they were satisfied that Otto was innocent and had no idea of Helmut's plans, they released him. Before leaving the building, the Gestapo told Otto that it was serious that they needed to win the war, eliminate Jews, and ended with saying that the LDS church would be next because they had no room for anything American. Five days later, the Mormon leader Arthur Xander excommunicated Helmut from the church to make a statement that they had nothing to do with having any of the same beliefs as Helmut. For the next few weeks, 
the boys were beat and tortured for sport. Carl recounted one occasion where a Gestapo was having a bad day and smashed his face in a concrete wall which gave him a bloody busted nose. He later got in trouble by other Gestapos for dirtying their clean wall. That was the type of abuse they encountered on a daily basis while being locked up. On August 11, 1942, Helmut was tried in court. While being questioned, he was asked if he truly believed Germany would lose the war, and he responded by saying, don't you? It was said that Helmut most likely knew his fate was sealed, so went out with confidence. He was found guilty of treason and for aiding the enemy in the war. For this, he was sentenced to death by method of the guillotine. Along with his sentence of death, he was sentenced to lose all of his civil rights, so while being held in prison, he had to endure constant abuse and was required to remain in a cold, empty cell with no mattress, toilet, or blankets. Before leaving court, Helmut looked towards the judge and said, Now I must die, even though I have committed no crime. So now it's my turn, but your turn will come. Fifteen-year-old Rudolf was sentenced to ten years at a labor camp, while seventeen-year-old Carl was sentenced to five years at a labor camp. The boys got lighter sentences because Helmut kept his word and took all of the blame. Carl knew this because before trial, the Gestapo made a mistake and the two boys were in the same area together and Helmut gave Carl a smile. In that moment, he knew that Helmut kept his word. While being held in prison, Helmut's mother was by his side and his lawyer appealed for clemency, but it was denied by the Nazi Ministry of Justice at 1.05 p.m., on October 27, 1942, the day of his execution. Before his execution, the Gestapo gave Helmut permission to write three letters, one to his mother, one to his grandparents, and one to a family of the church he attended. Helmut was then taken to this room, where he was executed and pronounced dead at 8.13 p.m. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Death Row Executions and now for discussion and question time. Has anyone noticed that throughout history, the bad, torturous groups always prevail and when innocents speak up or speak out, they are killed? The groups with ideologies of hate and division prevail while the ones expressing peace get shut down. I find it sad that this young brave boy was killed for speaking the truth. Do you guys think staying quiet would make you just as guilty as the ones handing out the evil? When we feel like our lives might be in danger, I think the safest thing we can think of is to stay quiet, and it takes brave people to speak out, speak up. Margaret Allen was born on September 2nd, 1906 in England. She grew up in a working class family and was number 20 out of the 22 children her parents had together. Growing up, she struggled with a gender and identity crisis, so she drifted away from her family. She was not feminine at all, and she lived in a time where if a woman was more on the masculine side, they were not as understood as they are today. She rebuked everything female and considered herself to be one of the guys. She only had male friends, and the jobs she had were jobs usually reserved for men. Some of these odd jobs were working construction on houses, loading coal, and she was also a bus conductor. Being a bus conductor was her favorite amongst them all because it was not as labor intensive as the other ones, and the uniform required her to wear pants, which made her feel more comfortable. Unfortunately for her, she was fired after four years because multiple passengers had complained of her rude and aggressive behavior. If a passenger was too slow to getting into a seat, she would cuss them out and or push them in a seat. Part of her acting like a man in her mind came with a certain demeanor, and she felt as if she needed to be tougher, look tougher, cuss, defend herself, and get physical just for respect. She also claimed to sometimes just get in funny moods. At the age of 29, Margaret felt that she was more than just a female lesbian, but a man. She left her home and checked into the St. Mary's Hospital in Manchester. 
Upon her return, she told neighbors that she went to the hospital to officially change her sex from female to male. Many today believe that this could not have been true because no one would have been willing to do such a procedure at the time, but whatever the case may be, she cut her hair very short, wore nothing but men's clothing, and asked people to start addressing her as Bill. Margaret would frequent men's clubs and only had male friends with the exception of a woman by the name of Annie Cook. Up until the time of her new identity, she hadn't had a relationship and she thought Annie could potentially be her first girlfriend. On one occasion, Margaret took a trip with Annie to a boarding house and they checked in as Mr. and Mrs. Allen. Although it seemed as if Annie was okay with her friend wanting to be a man, she was not okay with Margaret expressing that she wanted to be more than just friends. Annie denied her sexual advances and made it clear that she was only interested in a platonic relationship. After this event, Margaret kept more to herself and she encountered a string of bad luck. It was now 1943, her mother died, she had not worked for years and let herself go. She used the savings she did have to live in a dilapidated building that was once the local police headquarters on Backup Road. She was refusing to eat properly, started a smoking habit, did not practice good hygiene, and suffered from depression. Annie encouraged her to take better care of herself, but nothing worked. On top of that, her health was declining, and she was surviving off of 11 shillings a week in welfare and 26 shillings a week in national health sick pay. Another thing that could have contributed to her depression and identity crisis was the fact that she was going through menopause. She complained of headaches, dizzy spells, and more. She was in debt and also behind in rent and was being threatened with eviction. It had been two years since she had paid an electric or coal bill, and there were cases pending against her in court that she had not acknowledged. Fast forward a few years to 1948, Margaret's father was now dead as well, and none of her 21 siblings spoke with her. It was late August 1948, and a 68-year-old widow and miser by the name of Nancy Ellen Chadwick had been going around to different people asking for sugar. She was a housekeeper who lived about half a mile away from Margaret, and Nancy had money, but she hoarded her money and preferred to beg for things instead. When Nancy went around town asking for sugar, Margaret happened to be nearby and said that she would give her some. Over the next few days, Margaret had visited Nancy at her home without bringing any sugar, and Nancy was getting more curious and fascinated with a woman in town who dressed like a man. The last visit to Nancy's home was on Saturday, August 28, 1948, at around 8.30 in the morning. Margaret promised to bring Nancy some sugar that upcoming Monday, which would have been the 30th. Margaret left, and just an hour after their last encounter, Nancy was walking on Backup Road and saw Margaret at the door of her house and asked if that was her house. Margaret replied by saying yes, and when Nancy asked if she could come in, Margaret replied by saying, I'm afraid I haven't got time, Nancy. You can see inside another time. Ignoring Margaret, Nancy invited herself inside and closed the door behind her. Nancy was found dead the next morning at 4 o'clock a.m. after a bus driver noticed a body in the road covered in rags and sheets. During an autopsy of her body, a doctor determined that she had been dead for about 10 hours before her body was found, and he also determined that it was not a hit and run like the bus driver suspected, and her wounds were more in line with foul play. Police went back to the scene of the crime, and two people said that they were in the street near where the body was found at around 3.45 in the morning, so investigators suspected that her body was put there after 3.45 and before 4. While investigators were looking over the crime scene, Margaret made sure to stay around and watch what they were doing. At one point, she had even walked up to an investigator, tugged his sleeve, and pointed towards the River Irwell that was nearby. She was then quoted saying, Look, there's something there. Investigators went to see what the object was that was floating in the river, and it was Nancy's handbag. It had a few things in it, but what they did not know at the time was that Margaret had taken the money out. Feeling as if she had thrown investigators off her scent, she went to a local bar and started boasting about being the last person to see Nancy. Over the next couple of days, she would go back to the same bar and let as many people know that she helped investigators and was the last person to see Nancy. The only thing that she did not realize was that she was now talking to nosy journalists. She was quoted saying, I was the last person to see the old woman. 
and she was an old fool to sit on the roadside bench counting her money. She had even told journalists that Nancy was wearing an underskirt that had a hidden pocket, but they thought, how would Margaret know that? It was now September 1st, 1948, and police called Margaret in for questioning. They briefly visited her house on one occasion and found nothing out of the ordinary, but decided to check her house again in more detail. There was blood in the doorway sill, and they also found more marks near her cellar. Some of Nancy's belongings were found in her home, and the biggest piece of evidence for investigators was when they matched Nancy's hair to hair on some of Margaret's clothing. When Margaret was officially charged, she gave her confession. As I was saying, I was coming out of the house on Saturday last about 20 past 9 in the morning when Mrs. Chadwick came around the corner. She asked if this was where I lived and could she come in. I told her I was going out. I was in a funny mood and she seemed to get on my nerves, although she hadn't said anything. I said I would have to go and I was going out and she could see me sometime else, but she seemed somehow to insist on coming in. I just looked around and saw a hammer in the kitchen. This time, we were talking just inside the kitchen with the front door closed. On the spur of the moment, I hit her. She gave a shout that seemed to start me off more. It was a few times, but I don't know how many. Nancy was then placed in the coal house. I've told you where I was all day. That part is true, and true that I went to bed at 10 to 11. When I awoke, the thought of what was downstairs made me keep awake. I went downstairs but couldn't tell the time as all the clocks are broke. There were no lights in the road and I couldn't hear any footsteps. Margaret had intended to take Nancy to the Irwell River but she was not strong enough. Later I heard the noise outside and knew they had found her. I looked out of the window and saw the bus. Then I went back to sleep. Just before I put the body out I went round the corner and threw the bag into the river. I looked in the bag but there was no money in it. I didn't actually kill her for that. I had one of my funny turns. I had no reason to do it at all. It seemed to come over me. The noise after the first seemed to set me off. The metal part of the hammer was thrown in the Irwell River and the wood portion was used for her firewood. She first went to court on her 42nd birthday which was on September 2nd and her trial which was on December 8, 1948 lasted only five hours and her counsel tried to argue that she was insane given her coming to court dressed like a man and her past behavior. Her lawyer was quoted saying she was guilty but insane. You can't just go around beating old ladies of course, but given the stress Margaret was dealing with and her considerable need for privacy, it would be perhaps understandable if she had panicked and lashed out violently when a near stranger tried to push her way into her home. The effort to prove her being insane failed, and after minutes of deliberation, Margaret was found guilty and sentenced to death by method of hanging. Her longtime friend Annie Smith still cared for her friend Margaret and tried to encourage people to sign a petition to have her sentence commuted. Out of the 30,000 people in the community, only 162 people signed the petition. While locked up awaiting her death, many said that her behavior did not change from what it was on the outside. She argued with staff, was loud, complained a lot, and was not happy with how uncomfortable prison was. Margaret's execution was scheduled for January 12, 1949, which was just a little over a month after her trial in early December. Margaret was offered a last meal and she requested scrambled eggs, which was granted. When prison officials brought her her tray, she kicked the tray, causing the eggs to fly everywhere. She followed by saying, at least no one else will enjoy the meal. When it was time for execution day, Margaret gave no last words and showed no remorse before being hanged by Albert Pierpoint at the Strange Ways prison. Margaret was the first female execution in Britain since 12 years from her execution date, and she was the third to die at the Strange Ways prison. The prison chaplain wrote a letter that read, She was a woman with plenty of grit, and she faced it as a man would, and I felt the whole thing was brutal. She was well prepared and behaved like a man, in fact, she had more guts than most men I have seen. Before Margaret died, her first request was to have her friend Annie, who had been visiting her in lockup, to inherit her ring and cigarette lighter and the prison obliged. Her second and last request was to die like a man in men's clothing, but prison officials refused and she was required to wear a blue smock frock. Do you think the prison should have allowed her to wear men's clothing or does it not matter what the prisoner is going to die in? 
Hello, this is Air, and welcome to the 49th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Mariette Bosch, who was the first white woman hanged in Botswana. This story takes place in Pakalani, Botswana, which is a suburb near the capital, Gaborone. 42-year-old Mariette Bosch and her husband, Justin Bosch, moved from Petersburg, South Africa to Palenque, Botswana in 1992 because of the diamond industry, the thriving economy, and lower crime rates. Mariette was born in 1950 and was used to the finer things in life because her father was an affluent liquor store owner. When she married her intimidating, short-tempered husband, life was not always as happy as they appeared. Justin cheated on Mariette, but the two agreed to remain married and had three children together. The expat community the Boshes moved into was a white expat community filled with wealthy South Africans. Majority of the new homeowners in this private community had native Botswanian maids and garden boys. They were surrounded by golf courses, shopping plazas, casinos, and more. Mariette would enjoy all of these luxuries on a daily basis. The family even had two cars, with one of them being a brand new BMW. Within the next two years after their move, Mariette had become a member of Botswana's high society. She also began to regularly attend the Dutch Reformed Church in the capital of Gaborone. Moving into the community near the Boshes was married couple Maria or Ria and her husband Tiani Wolmerens. The two women became best friends and even took classes together like baking class and a class for decorating porcelain dolls. Not only did Mariette and Ria develop a bond, but Mariette was secretly developing a bond with Ria's husband, Tiani. Ria and her husband had a rocky relationship during this time and ended up separating but getting back together after a year in 1994. The affair between Mariette and Tiani began in the beginning of 1995 and not too long after their affair started, Mariette's husband, Justin, passed away in a car crash. Now, home alone, Mariette became more obsessed with the idea of starting a relationship with Tiani and he promised to divorce Ria so the two of them could be together. In the meantime, they would travel over four hours away to Johannesburg, South Africa to meet and have sex. A year had passed and Tiani had still not divorced his wife so Mariette was growing more and more impatient. She confided in Tiani's sister-in-law, Judith Bosch, and told her that she loved Tiani and wanted to be with him. Judith was dumbfounded by this information because Judith knew that Mariette knew she was not fond of her. With her mind set that she would be with Tiani, in June of 1996, Mariette drove to Petersburg, South Africa in hopes of obtaining a pistol from a friend. This friend had her late husband's collection so she knew he would not question anything. The friend agreed, and the very next day she crossed the border back to Botswana, smuggling the gun with her. The same day she made it back home, she waited until nighttime to drive two blocks away to where Ria and Tiani lived. Mariette then climbed a six-foot wall, walked through their back door where she saw Ria in the hallway, aimed, and fatally shot her two times. Some accounts say she could have also had a spare key and walked right in. Ria's daughter Mirna came into the house later that night and stepped on something large. She turned on the light and realized she was stepping on her mother. Mirna called for police, but by that time, Mariette had left and felt that she got away with the perfect crime because no one had suspected her. Initially, they thought it was the maid, but she was cleared. Tiani was also arrested and spent a night in jail before being released because he had an alibi. His co-workers said that he was far away on a job with them. Three months passed and police believed it was a robbery gone bad and had no suspects or leads. Mariette gave the gun she used to Judith's husband, who also happened to be Tiani's brother, but they did not bring up anything to Judith. Three months after the death of Rhea, Mariette ordered a wedding dress from a designer. At the same time, Judith found out that her husband was given the pistol Mariette had used and she put two and two together coming up with the conclusion that Mariette took things into her own hands in order to be with Tiani. Judith then took the pistol to the police department and not too soon after, Mariette was brought into the station for questioning. 
When detectives informed her that they had a weapon given to them, she yelled out, I pray the gun and the cartridges don't match. The detectives informed her that they did, and Mariette was subsequently charged with the murder of Rhea. Believing that Mariette was innocent, Tiani, his children, and Mariette's children supported her until the end. Mariette was hailed at Labatsi Prison, but 10 months after being locked up, the Dutch church she was a member of posted her bail. While out on bail, she and Tiani got married. She was free for 18 months until her trial started in December of 1999 at the Botswana Labatse High Court with Justice Isaac Aboyagye presiding over the case. While being held at Lubatse Prison, Mariette refused to eat the customary tripe meals given to prisoners and ended up losing weight and looking thinner by the day each time she went into court. Defense tried to argue that Mariette could not have climbed over a wall, and Mariette testified that although she did borrow a gun, the person she got it from put a concoction in her drink which hypnotized her into doing bad things. She asserted that he was a dangerous man and that Rhea had discovered irregularities in his financial records. Her story then changed to him being responsible for the actual crime. A psychiatrist for the defense went on stand and testified that Mariette was an elite member of society and did not fit the profile of a killer, which was immediately dismissed by Judge Isaac. Mariette's daughters then took to the stand and lied under oath stating that their mother was home all day and night which could not have been true if she had just crossed the border that day. Mariette's maid took the stand next and refuted everything the daughter said when she told everyone in court that Mariette left the house at 8 o'clock that night. Majority of the evidence during trial was circumstantial, but no one could argue the fact that she brought the gun from another country. While awaiting her sentence, many believed she would walk free, and Mariette herself said, God will deliver me from this nightmare. I have been framed, people have turned against me, but God will not. Tiani also believed his new wife would be okay and tried to convince others to reassure Mariette as well. One neighbor by the name of Stephanie Hugo said that Mariette was her friend and could not lie to her. She did not feel that Mariette was innocent or that she would get a light sentence. During trial, the judge made it aware without saying it that he believed Mariette was guilty. He laughed when questioning the psychologist about a hypothetical affair and love triangle. He also made aware of the fact that the psychologist, Dr. Louise, was a sex doctor for a popular magazine. The media was all over the case, and on February 21st, 2000, Justice Isaac found Mariette guilty of premeditated murder. In Botswana, if anyone commits murder, the death penalty is mandatory unless extenuating circumstances arise so Mariette was sentenced to death by hanging. While handing out the verdict, Judge Isaac said, I find that the accused and Tiani were seriously in love before the death of the deceased and that they wanted the deceased out of Tiani's way for them to get married. He also said, The crime was carefully planned with the motive of enabling you to take over the husband of the deceased. I have not been able to find one moral extenuating circumstance. You are not very young, you were not intoxicated, and you were not provoked. Mariette sunk her nails into her arms while her family had a more of a dramatic response in court. She was then taken to Gaborone Central Prison, and while awaiting her death, Mariette hired a British attorney by the name of Desmond De Silva, who was known for getting reprieves for more than 30 inmates. Desmond encouraged judges from England, Nigeria, Scotland, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, Commonwealth nations, to sit on the Botswana Panel of Appeals under the post-colonial judicial system, and he argued the fact that prosecutors did not disclose the fact that they gave immunity to a suspect if they agreed to testify against Mariette. Her appeal trial began on January 18, 2001, and ended the next day. It wasn't until January 20, 2001, Mariette found out her appeal was denied. After hearing the news, many people in the community rejoiced and danced in the street, saying she was given a just punishment for her crime. Mariette's fate was not yet sealed because she still had not heard from the president of Botswana, Mr. Festus Mogay. Many believe that in a country that is pro-capital punishment, nothing would change the president's mind, and they were right because one week before her death, President Mogay failed to grant clemency. During her final moments, the government of South Africa also refused to intervene and did not ask for her to be extradited. 
Mariette spent her last few months on death row in a single cell with only a mattress for sleeping or relaxing and a bucket used for the restroom. Almost every day she was given tripe and morugo or cow intestines and spinach for her meals. She claimed to have constant nightmares and overall had a hard time with her last days on earth. In Botswana, executions are carried out in secret, so with no warning, on March 30, 2001, Mariette was read her death warrant and was told she would die early the next morning, which was on a Saturday. Prison officials did not allow her to have any visitors, and they made no public statement beforehand, and she was not allowed to have a final meal. With this new information, Mariette spent her final moments writing letters to her husband Tiani and her children. The following morning at 6 o'clock, a priest, a prison doctor, and prison officials were the only witnesses to her death. Coincidentally, three weeks prior to her death, Tiani had scheduled a visit for Friday the 30th, but prison officials called him and let him know the visit had to be postponed due to an inspection and he would be able to come the following Monday. When he arrived the following Monday with his children, prison officials notified him that Mariette had already been hanged, so there were no final goodbyes. They were given Mariette's belongings, and then they were asked to leave the prison. Tiene made a final statement to the press. The manner in which Mariette was executed was totally and completely indecent. I cannot fathom the reason for it. We had filed a petition for clemency. It was a preliminary petition in which we made clear to President Moguet that we needed time to prepare a full petition. We also told him that we were arranging for a psychiatrist to evaluate Mariette's state of mind. I believe the story they told us about an inspection was a lie. They will probably make up anything now. I found out the pastor who was visiting her every week was not allowed to see her on Friday. Mariette had nobody to comfort her, nobody to try and help her, to be with her in her final hours. And now for a discussion and question time. I know with prisons in America, death row inmates usually get a decent meal and it's not the same meal every single day. Do you feel that Mariette's daily meal of tripe and spinach was not fair or do you think that it was completely fair? What do you feel about executions being held in private and loved ones not being able to say goodbye or being informed of the executions? Don't you guys find it odd that Tiani married his wife's best friend? I also find it odd that all of their kids believed her as well. I think some kids will believe anything their parents say, and I would not trust her or him. Lindsay June Sandiford was born on June 25, 1956 in the United Kingdom. She had two children, and Lindsay lived an honest life, or at least was never caught doing anything illegal. It wasn't until 2012 when Lindsay decided to do the unthinkable at 56 years old. On May 19, 2012, Lindsay took a flight to Bangkok, Thailand from the United Kingdom. Her next flight was from Bangkok using the Thai Airways to Bali, which is a province in Indonesia. She arrived at the Nagura Rai International Airport and happened to be chosen for a routine luggage check. The routine luggage check turned out to be a gold mine for the airport authorities because they found 10.6 pounds of cocaine in the lining of her suitcase. Investigators began questioning her about the large amount of drugs in her suitcase, and she initially told them that she was forced into smuggling the drugs by a gang who threatened her and her family. Investigators told her that drug smuggling offenses can carry a death sentence, so she decided to come clean thinking that they would be lenient with her for working with them. She claimed that she was asked to smuggle the drugs by a couple who was living in Bali. The couple was Julian Ponder and Rachel Duggle. Julian was a British antique dealer. Lindsay was arrested, but investigators still followed up on her claims about Julian and Rachel. Their home was searched, and police uncovered almost 49 grams of cocaine and 3 grams of marijuana, so they were both charged with drug trafficking as well. Later that year, Lindsay's trial began. She reverted back to her first story that a gang made her smuggle the drugs as her defense. Her lawyers tried to argue that she had a history of mental health issues and it made it hard for her not to be pressured when it came to threats. Although claiming to be innocent, she apologized to the court. I would like to begin by apologizing to the Republic of Indonesia and the Indonesian people for my involvement. I would have never become involved in something like this, but the lives of my children were in danger 
and I felt I had to protect them. Lindsay's son testified in court as well, saying that he felt his mother was forced to carry the drugs due to a disagreement she had with someone when he was unable to pay rent and she paid it for him. I think the judges did not take into consideration Lindsay's remorse for her actions. In her previous statements, she has already said that she regretted what she did and she has apologized to the people of Indonesia. Dr. Jennifer Fleetwood also testified on Lindsay's behalf. There is evidence to suggest that a trafficker would seek someone who was vulnerable. Having reviewed extracts from Lindsay's medical records, I know that Lindsay has a history of mental health issues. This may have unfortunately made her an attractive target for threats, manipulation, and coercion. Lindsay's defense and surprisingly prosecutors also recommended Lindsay to be spared from the death penalty and receive a 15-year custodial sentence. Julian Ponder was cleared of drug smuggling, but he was convicted of being in possession of narcotics and was sentenced to six years in prison. Rachel Duggle was found guilty of failing to report a crime. As for Lindsay, despite everyone else involved getting leniency in terms of their sentences, on January 22, 2013, a panel of judges ruled there were no mitigating circumstances in Lindsay's favor and they would have to impose the death sentence. The judges all shared their thoughts on Lindsay. Amser Simanjuntak said that Lindsay's actions ruined Bali's reputation as a tourist destination and she undermined Indonesia's fight against drugs. Kumang Wijaya Adi said Lindsay showed no remorse. Lindsay Sandiford was expecting a guilty verdict today, but nothing like this. Lindsay Sandiford has been found guilty of importing narcotics. The defendant is sentenced to death. She was then transferred to Kiribokan prison to await her execution. When Lindsay was sentenced to death, the last execution in Indonesia was in the year 2008. But in February 2013, Indonesia's Attorney General, Basrif Arif, said that they would be resuming executions. They resumed on March 15, 2013, and Lindsay began writing her family members thinking she would be executed very soon. Indonesia's executions are carried out by firing squads in a discreet location in the middle of the night, and typically the inmates get no heads up, so she was very frightened. Years went by, Lindsay was not executed, and she began appealing her sentence. Her appeals kept getting rejected due to the fact that there has not been any new evidence presented and there is no proof that there was negligence in the trial. Other information, like Lindsay being a first-time offender, has not been a sufficient reason for them to change her sentence. Back in the UK, where they no longer carry out executions, a law firm was working hard to seek judicial help from the UK government. They were seeking a review of the law that stated the UK government does not provide funds for the legal representation of British nationals facing criminal proceedings overseas. The case was heard by the High Court in front of Mrs. Justice Gloucester and Mrs. Justice Nicola Davies on January 31st, and they ruled that Lindsay had no reasonable prospect of success. As of today, no one at this point can save Lindsay and she is still currently on death row awaiting her execution. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Do you think foreigners deserve leniency when they commit crimes in other countries? Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Hello everyone, this is Air, and welcome to the 56th episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Irma Gries, who was an SS guard for Nazi Germany and was sentenced during the Belzen trials after World War II. First film of the Belzen trial. This is being held before a British military court in a converted gymnasium in Lüneburg. The prisoners arrive. Altogether, 45 men and women. Last to get out of the first truckload is Kramer, the former commandant of Belzen. You'll probably recognize him. The second truck contained the women SS guards, accused equally with the men of appalling crimes of cruelty and mass murder. One of the most prominent among the women prisoners is Irma Grazer, number nine. Irma Gries was born on October 7, 1923, in Germany. She was one of five siblings, 
and grew up with both parents. Her father Alfred was an agricultural worker who eventually began to have an affair on his wife Berta. Berta was unable to handle the heartbreak, so in 1936 when Irma was just 13 years old, her mother drank hydrochloric acid and ended her life. Irma then stopped attending school after elementary and began working. Her sister Helene said that growing up, Irma never had the courage to fight when other girls got into it and would sometimes even run away to avoid confrontation. After elementary school, she began to work on farms like her father before leaving to work at a shop. At the age of 15, she worked at a hospital for two years and eventually decided she wanted to be a nurse, but she was turned down. She and her sisters wanted to join an association for German girls that would help them with work, but Alfred did not approve. When she turned 18 in 1941, she went against her father's wishes and moved to an SS training base for women that was located near a female concentration camp called Ravensbrück. When she completed her training, some say she was given the job at Ravensbrück, and other accounts say she volunteered. It was July of 1942 when she officially became a guard at the Ravensbrück camp. She lost contact with her family except for a few meetups they had in which she was not fully honest with what she did and witnessed at the camp. On one particular visit, her father Alfred officially kicked her out of the home because he was against her taking part in anything that had to do with the SS. Back at Ravensbrück, Irma was dubbed the hyena by prisoners. She always walked around in heavy boots, a whip, and a gun. She had been given orders from her superiors not to beat or kill any prisoners, but she did not follow any rules and would frequently kill for the fun of it. After she was caught, there was a homemade lamp found in her quarters that was made from the skin of three different prisoners. At a later date, Irma said she protested against becoming a guard, but that did not stop her from accepting a promotion the following year in March of 1943 when she was transferred to the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. At this camp, she excelled in the eyes of her superiors, and in 1944, she was eventually promoted to the second highest rank a female guard could have. She was under the commander, Joseph Kramer, and he too gave Irma orders about no whips being allowed, amongst other things, but she continued to break the rules and walked around with a clear cellophane whip an SS dog, and her gun. She actively took part in selecting which prisoners would go to the gas chamber, and her dislike for Jewish people grew. In the beginning of 1945, Irma, along with other SS guards, transported prisoners from Auschwitz to Ravensbrück, and then she was transferred to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. On April 17, 1945, the British Army came to liberate the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, and all SS guards who had not escaped were captured. There were approximately 10,000 bodies scattered throughout the camp, and 58,000 survivors, with some of those survivors later becoming witnesses during the trial to testify against Irma. The Belsen trials were trials held by Allied occupation forces, and it began on September 17, 1945. All of the defendants on trial were former officials of Nazi Germany and also capos who were camp prisoners picked by SS guards to supervise other prisoners. In total, there were 12 capos and 32 SS guards on trial with 16 female SS guards and 16 male SS guards. The trial lasted for exactly two months, ending on November 17, 1945. Irma's sister Helene testified in court, along with other witnesses who spoke about Irma beating prisoners up until a day before British troops arrived. Although denying majority of the accusations made against her, witnesses also said that one day, when Irma had to select a group to be killed, two young girls jumped out of a window and Irma shot them down. Out of all of the women on trial, Irma was the only female SS guard and camp worker that was sentenced to death. It's been said that while being sentenced, she was the only one who was insolent 
and showed no remorse. While awaiting her execution, she was held at Hamlin Prison. Irma's execution day was scheduled for December 13, 1945. Just a day before her execution, up until the day of, she spent her time singing Nazi songs with a fellow female prisoner by the name of Johanna Borman. Before her execution, she was examined by British executioner Albert Pierpoint, who was in charge of handling all of the hangings for the condemned Belzen trial prisoners. Irma was 5'3", 113 pounds, and when she made eye contact with Albert, she was angered and shouted out that he was doing the Jews' work. After her outburst, she was chosen to be hanged first. Women were said to be executed first, and men were executed in pairs, so she was the first in her group to go that day. It was around 9.30 a.m., and prisoners were in their cells. Albert Pierpoint called out for Irma and her cell door was opened. He asked Irma to follow him and his assistant by the name of Sergeant Major Richard Anthony O'Neill translated what he said in German. At exactly 9.34 a.m., she was now in the execution chamber. She stood on a mark and had a white hood placed over her head. Her last word was quickly in German and moments after she uttered the word, the trap door flung open. Albert Pierpoint and a doctor went down the stairs to check on her and make sure she was dead. She was hanging there for another 20 minutes before she was taken down, and after that, her body was placed in a coffin and she was buried in this exact area for war criminals. Thank you guys for watching, and now for discussion and question time. Irma was caught with a human skin lampshade and to me, she treated them as if they were less than animals. Their lives meant nothing because it was easy for her to kill them and for her to keep them around after their death. What do you think about people who harbor so much hate for a specific group of people? Also, was it better that she showed her true colors before death as opposed to pretending to be remorseful? If someone killed your family member, would you prefer a fake apology and fake remorse? You might think it's genuine in that moment and not really know it's fake. Or would you prefer knowing they did not care? Now my next discussion question might be a little tough for some people, but I would love it if you guys had an open mind. And it came. this question came to me because of certain arguments that are started amongst some of you guys under certain videos. But throughout history, Whenever there has been a group of people oppressing another, the oppressed people eventually get retribution. So after the Holocaust, Jews were given money and guards were jailed and or executed. There was a sense of retribution, especially when other countries were on their side and came to help. After the Vietnam War, the Vietnamese people were offered reparations from multiple countries with one figure being over three billion spread over the course of some years. After Pearl Harbor and the sentiments towards Japanese not being so high, President Franklin Roosevelt signed an executive order that authorized incarcerating people of Japanese descent. After Japanese Americans fought for their retribution, they were able to get $1.6 billion in reparations. Native Americans were killed off and they are allowed to keep their own reservations. I don't think that's really a plus because it was Native American land to begin with. But a group of people that I can think of that have never been given reparations to that extent have been African Americans. What's crazy is that slave owners actually received money from the government for loss of property when they lost their slaves. So it was like the other way around and a slap in the face, if you ask me. There were no other countries coming to liberate slaves in America, and I think African Americans have come a long way after years of being told their lives meant nothing and basically starting at a disadvantage. What do you think about people who are not able to get retribution? Do you think they would feel supported? If nothing happened to the Nazi party, don't you think Jewish people would feel as if what happened to them was okay in the minds of others? 
This is not meant to offend, but to get us to think and brainstorm. I like relating these stories to current events, and the stories always have me taking a deeper look into other issues. इस बात को तो मैं सदा बिना छिपाए कहता रहा हूं कि मैं गांधी जी के सिद्धांतों के विरोधी सिद्धांतों का प्रचार कर रहा हूं मेरा यह पूर्ण विश्वास रहा है कि अहिंसा का अति प्रचार हिंदू जाति को अत्यंत निर्बल बना देगा इसलिए मैंने निश्चय किया कि सार्वजनिक कार्य में लगू और अपने जैसे विचारों के व्यक्तियों का संगठन करूं Nathuram Gadse was born on May 19, 1910 in India. He grew up in an orthodox Brahmin family to parents Vinayak and Lakshmi. Their religion was Hindu, but as a Brahmin, that meant they ranked highest out of the four social classes within Hindu India. The priests, the warrior class, the Vaishya class, which is the class of traders, and the Shudra class, which is the class of laborers. The Brahmin priest class believe that they inherit greater ritual purity and are capable of performing important and vital tasks the religion requires. Members in this group are also tasked with reciting sacred scriptures and consider themselves to be spiritual elite. Now, with the context of the class Nathuram's family was in, his family still believed that they were cursed. Nathuram's parents had four daughters before he was born who all survived. They also had four boys, but they all died in infancy. His parents Vinayak and Lakshmi believed that the male children in their family were cursed, so when he was born, they felt the only thing that would get rid of the curse was to raise Nathuram as a girl. Nathuram was named Ramchandra at birth, and his parents gave him a nose ring. It wasn't until his parents gave birth to another boy who survived that they allowed Nathuram to be a boy. The name Nathuram came about because his nickname from Ramchandra was Ram, and Nath meant nose ring, so his name meant Ram who wears a nose ring. With the family curse believing to have gone away, Nathuram's family now believed he had special powers. The family had their own personal goddess, and Nathuram would sit in front of her and go into a trance acting as a medium between the goddess and his family. Although his family felt he was gifted at home, academics were a different story. He grew up to be athletic despite him being raised as a girl, but did not do well in school. One of the first jobs he tried to get required an exam, and he was not able to pass it. He had aspirations because it was a government job, but it was just hard for him and he eventually dropped out of high school. During this time, Gandhi was popular and Nathuram and his brother Gopal used to idolize him. This changed, however, when he got older and felt that Gandhi was being too nice to Muslims and favoring them over Hindus. Gandhi had incited the non-cooperation movement in order to induce the British government of India to grant self-government. The movement was one of their first large-scale acts of civil disobedience. Nathuram felt empowered and influenced by Gandhi only because of him wanting a British free India. This movement, however, caused different groups to form who also wanted recognition. On one end, there was the All India Muslim League, and there were also groups that wanted an All Hindu India. The Hindu organizations did not want to cooperate or work with Muslims at all, and despised the fact that Gandhi was cordial with the groups and willing to work with them against British rule. In 1929, at the age of 19, Nathuram's family moved to Ratnagiri. Here, he grew to idolize someone new political prisoner Vinayak Damodar Savakar. Vinayak was a leader of an extremist Hindu nationalist party called Savardeshak Hindu Sabha, which means Hindu assembled for the entire country. He and his followers did not support Gandhi's Indian freedom movement against British rule in India. They did not believe in non-violent civil disobedience either. He believed that there was nothing wrong with being violent and the Hindus should do whatever necessary to gain control over the British. Vinayak was arrested and convicted of waging a conspiracy against the King Emperor and for the abetment to murder someone. In 1921, he was transferred to a jail in Ratnagiri, and while imprisoned, he wrote his own theory called Essentials of Hinduva, which focused on a Hindu society. Vinayak was released from prison in 1924, but he was not able to travel and was restricted to live in a bungalow provided by the government in Ratnagiri up until 1937. Over the next few years, he met influential people such as Gandhi, Dr. Ambedkar, and in 1929, none other than Nataram Gadse, who agreed with all of his works and beliefs. After spending time with Vinayak, Nataram briefly stayed with his father in Sangli, where he began working as a tailor and joined another organization called the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which was a Hindu nationalist organization. He met up with Vinayak in the late 1930s again and was tasked with leading protest in Hyderabad. 
During one protest, he was arrested and had to spend one year in prison. Upon his release from prison and now in his 30s, Nathuram vowed to remain celibate and focus on the movement along with reading and learning. In 1944, he and a friend started their own newspaper called Agrani. The purpose of the newspaper was to spread Hindu propaganda. Initially, the newspaper struggled, but it started to gain momentum when tension increased between Hindus and Muslims. Nathuram and his partner renamed their newspaper from Agrani to Hindu Rastra and moved to a larger office earning much more than they ever had before. In 1947, after fighting for so many years, India finally gained their independence. With the independence came a portion of Pakistan becoming a new territory for a Muslim state. This outraged many Hindu nationalists, and Nathuram in particular was very disturbed when Gandhi made it known to the public that he would be fasting to protest the Indian government withholding funds to Pakistan that they had promised. Gandhi's fast slash hunger strike began on January 14, 1948, and at this time, he was staying in Delhi at the Birla Mansion. Gandhi actually arrived at the Birla Mansion on September 9, 1947. It was noted that Gandhi would spend the whole day talking to people, spinning a charka, and praying. He always started his day and ended his day with prayer. He prayed using both Hindu and Muslim scriptures because that was his way of stressing the unity of the religions. Although he was fasting and at peace, Angry people who were against him would shout outside of the mansion that they wanted Gandhi to die. On January 13, 1948, Gandhi was quoted saying, Death for me would be a glorious deliverance rather than I should be a helpless witness to the destruction of India, Hinduism, Sikhism, and Islam. He then explained that his dream was for the Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, and Muslims of all India to live together in unity. The following day on January 14, when Gandhi boarded a train, Hindus planned an attack to kill Gandhi, but their attack failed, and one of the conspirators was caught. Nathuram, his brother, and his partner in crime, Nayaran Apte, were there, but were not caught. On September the 9th, 1947, Gandhi moved into the Delhi home of his friend, the industrialist and Congress party supporter, Ganshiam Das Birla. In January of the following year, Gandhi began another indefinite fast, saying he would only eat if he saw a plan to stop the continuing violence. Hindus who had fled persecution in Pakistan were dumbfounded by Gandhi's empathy for Muslims, which was inherent in the second indirect goal of his fasting. Gandhi's hunger strike was also aimed at forcing the Indian government to release Pakistan's share of assets from the treasury of British India. De l'Inde britannique euh, qui euh, lui revient. Gandhiji, that stood in favor of Pakistan and said that I shall go on hunger strike, I shall die, and the 55 crores should be given. Then only I shall release my fast. At that moment, some youths like me, decided you will not die of hunger strike, you will die of bullets now. In response to the attack, Gandhi said, if I am to die by the bullet of a madman, I must do so smiling. There must be no anger within me. God must be in my heart and on my lips. A week after the attack, Nathuram and Nayaran returned to Delhi, but this time with a Beretta automatic pistol. It was January 30th, 1948, at around 5 o'clock p.m. Gandhi, who I had mentioned was fasting, did not have his full strength, and his great nieces were helping him walk around on the mansion grounds. He was on his way to a prayer meeting and was greeted by a crowd of supporters. Nathuram was in front of the crowd. He bowed in front of Gandhi, pulled out his pistol, and then shot him three times in the stomach and chest. Before falling to the ground, Gandhi raised his hands up in front of his face, which was a normal Hindu form of greeting. Some say he cried out God twice. As people swarmed and attacked Nathuram, everyone forgot to call for help, so Gandhi was still lying on the floor and he died in under 30 minutes without getting any medical attention. Onlookers were able to get the gun away from Nathuram and restrained him until cops arrived. He was arrested and sent to jail to await his trial. His trial began on May 27, 1948, and he was tried with other co-defendants, including Narayan, at the Punjab High Court in Peterhof, Simia, India. During trial, Nathuram gave a long speech 
and many said it was eloquent as well. He expressed his devotion to the Hindu people, and he mentioned, I took courage in both my hands, and I did fire the shots at Gandhiji on 30th January 1948 on the prayer grounds of Birla House. I do say that my shots were fired at the person whose policy and action had brought rack and ruin and destruction to millions of Hindus. Nathuram brought up how he didn't like the fact that Gandhi wanted to create a new language called Hindustani. The goal for the Hindustani language would be to combine Hindu and the official language of Pakistan. The main reason above everything that bothered him was Gandhi's support of Muslims. Gandhi is being referred to as the father of the nation, but if that is so, he has failed in his paternal duty in as much as he has acted very treacherously to the nation by his consenting to the partitioning of it. His inner voice, his spiritual power, his doctrine of non-violence, of which so much is made of, proved to be powerless. I thought to myself and foresaw, I shall be totally ruined, and the only thing I could expect from the people would be nothing but hatred, and that I shall have lost all my honor, even more valuable than my life, if I were to kill Gandhiji. But at the same time, I felt that the Indian politics in the absence of Gandhiji would surely be proved practical, able to retaliate, and would be powerful with armed forces. No doubt my own future would be totally ruined, but the nation would be saved from the inroads of Pakistan. Gandhi's sons tried to prevent Nathuram from a death sentence because they said it was against their father's teachings, but their cries and Nathuram's speech was not powerful enough. The court found Nathuram and his partner in crime, Narayan Apte, guilty and sentenced them both to death by hanging on February 10, 1949. On November 15, 1949, Nathuram and Narayan were both hanged at Ambala Prison. When Gandhi died, the Indian Prime Minister Pandit Nehru went on the radio and said, the father of the nation is no more. Now that the light has gone out of our lives, I do not quite know what to tell you and how to say it. Our beloved leader is no more. There were over one million people that lined up to the funeral procession near the bank of the Jumna River. The state president of the Hindu Mahasabha was quoted saying, Nathuram Gadse was a part of the Hindu Mahasabha and we are all followers of his ideologies. BJP and RSS have avoided discussing him as they fear the political repercussions of openly backing Godse. However, 60% of the youth today believe in Godse's ideologies, not Gandhi's. We observed his death anniversary to spread awareness about his ideologies. To date, many people still celebrate Nathuram Godse on his death anniversary, 